My approach as a psychiatrist includes concepts of prevention, wellness, and holistic healing. I really come from a wellness mindset, not an illness mindset. I value science. I value my Western medicine training. So when I see my patients, I do think in terms of assessing a biological point of view, psychological and social. However, I couple that with all pathways to well-being. I value and I appreciate medicine and neuroscience from a materialistic worldview and a classic classical physics worldview. However, my understanding and the way I assess people includes a multidimensional and open-minded perspective that allows one to go further and embrace the material understanding of the universe as well as now embrace the post-materialism paradigm, which includes our information that we have from the understanding of quantum physics. And this makes us realize that our thoughts and our mind and our energy vibration can influence our health, our well-being, our immunology, Is the difference between uh, meditation for daily stress and other way of meditation. First, of course, the difference, it's a, it's a thing to talk about uh, meditation, spirituality, mindfulness, and it's another thing to live in a monastery. was uh, my life when I was in Kathmandu, in Copan Monastery. So, Copan Monastery is uh, uh, the biggest monastery in Himalayas. Uh, 1,000 monks, 1,000 nuns. And it's special because in, when we live like that, uh, we have a Rinpoche. A Rinpoche in Tibetan means precious. So my Rinpoche, Chepa Dorje Rinpoche, uh, was uh, very strict. And Chepa Dorje Rinpoche was a disciple of Chatral Rinpoche. Chatral Rinpoche in Buddhism is very unique. He passed away a few years ago at 102 years old. He was exceptional. So, Chatral Rinpoche, Chepa Dorje Rinpoche, and also all comes from a lineage. So, to live in a monastery, to have a Rinpoche, to arrive from a lineage, it's, it's a special experience. Because we must be <laughs> what we say, we must be what we teach. We must be um, stable in the mind. We must be happy, we must be grateful. It is so important. But the difference between other way of meditation and meditation for daily stress, we don't uh, practice outside of the stress. Uh, because you know, if you practice any relaxation, any meditation in a quiet room, in a landscape, in a retreat, in a monastery. It's beautiful, really beautiful. But when we go back to our job, when we go back to our daily life, to when we go back to the traffic, 
When we go back to the subway in New York City, we are stressed again. A few hours after. It's like if we go in holidays and we go back home, we lose the tan of the skin. So it is the reason why when uh, we meditate outside of the stress, I think it's not enough efficient. We need to meditate inside the stress. I organize a retreat in Times Square. We are in Times Square. I have two students, Misha and Daria. They learn meditation. And I am so happy to come with my students here. It's my favorite place to meditate. Because if we are able to feel peace in Times Square, we can feel peace anytime, anywhere. Sleep is so important for good physical and emotional well-being. We spend one-third of our life sleeping. Prevention, wellness, and early intervention for all different types of physical and emotional issues require a good night's sleep. Did you know that 70 to 80% of lifelong mental health challenges begin in childhood? Do you know what this means? If we can encourage our children at a very young age to have good sleep hygiene, that can give a lot of prevention for anxiety, for depression, overall stress, and it allows your body to utilize its own innate healing powers. Different ages require different amounts of sleep. The American Academy of Sleep says that the best amount of sleep for an adult is about seven hours, but that can vary. You have to know yourself. It's very important that if you need more sleep or less sleep that you get that. Do you feel rested in the morning? For teenagers, it's eight to 10 hours. And there's a whole list of sleep hours with infancy all the way up to elderly. So it's important that you get the adequate amount of sleep for you. Did you know that it's so important to limit your caffeine after noon each day, avoid alcohol or limit your alcohol intake. These are things that can help for a good night's sleep. Also, we're living in the time of being always plugged in. At this time in history, we're living at a time where we're always connected to our social media. It's very important, I have to tell the teens in my practice and the children in my practice and the adults to make sure you turn off your iPhone one, at least one hour before you go to bed. And also, did you know that exercising four to five hours before you go to bed is very important because if you exercise closer to the time you go to bed, it raises your body temperature, which can prevent you from having a good night's sleep.
Some other tips are having your own sleep routine. It's very, very important to use your bed only for sleeping or for other activities. So some things that I do with my patients when they come to me is we really make sure that they aren't doing a lot of activity that excites them right before bed, that they have a nice routine, perhaps listen to music, some people pray, they meditate. So having a nice routine where you associate the routine you have with sleeping, very important. What can we do when we need to sleep better? In meditation for daily stress, if we want to sleep better, we meditate like a dolphin. What does it mean? When we live all time, there is a world outside us. During the day, we have a lot of thought, a lot of uh, noises, tensions, stress. This is a world outside. And when we go to the night, when we go to the sleep, we have also a world inside. If uh, we believe in God, we can say we go back to our soul. In Buddhism, we say we take refuge. Uh, we take refuge. If we talk in neuroscience, we explain that we change the matter gray and white because suddenly we use some region of the brain that usually we don't use. Like Dr. Denise explained, we can unplug the, the iPhone. I remember when I live in my monastery, we don't go to bed like that. It's a ritual, it's an honor to go to sleep. So we meditate like a dolphin. What does it mean? We go from the world outside to the world inside. I remember during some years I was looking for the perfect metaphor for the visualization. How can we go from the world outside to the world inside, to our soul, to our space, to our spiritual dimension? And one day I swim in Santa Monica. I love to swim. And I saw a dolphin. Oh, the dolphin jumps and dive. And it was for me the perfect metaphor. So before to sleep, we can meditate like a dolphin. We see we, around us, huh, we can be sit down on our bed. We see a room, we see the world outside, we see huh, the, the world and suddenly we breathe in. We keep our breath and we die. Inside us. What can we do when we have a PTSD crisis? 
Post-traumatic stress disorder is an anxiety disorder when an individual has experienced a physical threatening, emotional threatening, or sometimes a natural disaster. Or, depending on the person, we are all neurodiverse. So people can experience PTSD symptoms, being exposed to social media, being exposed to a person that reminds them of someone with a trauma. So we must remember that we are all neurodiverse. We all process and perceive information in our own unique way. So for one person, an event may or may not cause a trauma. Very important to remember. Usually, someone starts having flashbacks, startle response, nightmares, really bad dreams, or sometimes they'll have, with, when I work with kids, I call it a sticky thought. For adults, I call it a ruminative thought. When you have the same thought over and over again, and you just can't get rid of it. So if you are in an environment and you think, oh my gosh, someone's gonna hurt me, oh my gosh, someone's gonna traumatize me, or if you hear a loud boom, it might feel like an earthquake that you experienced. So there's many different ways someone can present with this type of anxiety. Usually the first person someone goes to see is a primary care doctor and then depending on where someone lives they might start seeing a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a healer or a spiritual leader to help them work through their trauma. An important thing to remember is that we also are multidimensional beings. So depending on the person's belief system, I incorporate that into my treatment. So I have and value my Western medicine science and the way we have criteria in the DSM-5. However, we are not only human beings, but we are also souls and light beings. So I really honor each person that comes to see me. So if their belief system includes the thought of an eternal soul, I do integrate the possibility that they might have had a trauma or something at another time. So sometimes people have trauma in this lifetime, and I know we would need more data, but we can talk about this at another time, but some people have some soul imprints, and then I usually guide them to other people that are in the spiritual healing modality. So that's another part of the treatment plan. So usually someone will present to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and you will start giving them breathing exercises. In fact, what Michelle said is so perfect. The more when I see someone, like let's say the example that just happened in the last week. I had a college student who had some trauma, she had some sexual trauma up at college. And actually I'm calling it sexual trauma because even if you say the word rape, that word, if someone's had that kind, that actually can be hurtful to them, that word. So if someone's had sexual trauma, when I'm meeting with them for the first time, it's so important of course to have compassion and love and care. And as a doctor, you don't want to re-traumatize someone. So I have a way of making sure I connect with someone, ask them what happened, and then it's really important that you check in with someone and ask them in their own words how they want to talk about it. So for instance, um, with this beautiful young woman who's in her healing process of this trauma, we call it the event because we're trying not to give too much power because she wants to not feel like a victim. So in the actual assessment, we look and see, is, she, is someone having depression, anxiety, OCD, family, life? Then if we think it's PTSD, then we do a course of therapy. We also do um, 
We consider medication only after therapy has been tried, good nutrition, and all the other healthy coping strategies. So the other thing I really, really want to mention right now is that I believe that we also need to limit the exposure of negative media. The quality and the quantity of being on social media, Twitter, the news, that can also create a PTSD mentality. So I think it's very important that you know your own neuro style and pay attention to your reaction. And you can do this with individuals that you hang out with, the news, or so on. So we often think of PTSD like a big traumatic event, like an earthquake or a sexual trauma. However, watching the news or being on social media all the time and hearing negative and fear-based thinking can create trauma in itself. Okay, so we've got some good tools here. And of course, good exercise, good nutrition, Practicing mindfulness, visualization, meditation, all give you a great foundation for having the least amount of stress and being able to cope and heal when you're experiencing anxiety. What can we do when we have a PTSD crisis? First, I think really like explained Dr. Denise, um, all the environment when we are all the time on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on TV, on news all the time, because in, with the news, we receive all the time, all the time, mental toxin, the suffering of the world. It's very rare to see some happy news. Huh? All the time news, it's all the time sad, uh, it's all the time uh, bad emotion. So, what can we do when we have PTSD? So, of course, like explained Dr. Denise, PTSD can come from traumatism, from many reasons. But in meditation for daily stress, we don't work about the causality, but we work about something simple. What can we do to feel better immediately when we have a PTSD crisis. We can meditate like an horizon. We can have a brain wave flat because when we have a PTSD crisis, our brain it's like a storm. There is a waves all time of the thought. It's it's a storm in the brain, in the consciousness. So we need one thing to unplug the brain, to have a brain wave flat to meditate like an horizon. So in the practice, when the person come and say, oh, Michel, I have a PTSD crisis, I don't feel good, we don't talk. Just we snap three times. And we visualize our thought like the jolts. We breathe in and <coughs> we unplug. The brain wave is flat. We become an horizon. What to do when you have anxiety? I think that even the word anxiety triggers a neurochemical reaction and you become more stressed. So the words that we choose are very powerful. So right now, let's use the word stress.
One of the biggest tips that I use throughout my day is I like to have my own mantra and I highly recommend that you come up with your own. Unbelievable. When Michelle was talking about the POA, I couldn't believe it. My mantra throughout the day is be loving and be kind. I say that throughout the day and it infuses me with love, it recharges me, and then my patients, my family, my friends, my loved ones can feel the love. It's like hitting reset. It's very important that you come up with your own word, your own healing word. So that can be very helpful with stress. Other things can be a visualization of a nature scene, spending time in nature to reduce stress. Good nutrition. Exercise. All of those things are the best medicine. Giving back in your community. And being charitable reduces stress. So being altruistic is a big part of a wellness plan. Integrate your own mindfulness plan. That's what the, is the most important. I cannot emphasize that. When you are realizing how powerful you are as a soul, as a human being, your thoughts, your actions, your words, you can heal yourself. We are very, very powerful as human beings. Now I know some people are listening and said, I've done all of that. I've done this, I've done that, blah, blah, blah. There are times when it is important to go to your primary care doctor, a psychiatrist, a healer, a psychologist, and get a more individualized treatment plan. In my line of work as a psychiatrist, I see children, I see teens, I see adults, and symptoms of anxiety, when it's a more clinical, repetitive, every day, where you've done all your wellness strategies. There are diagnoses of generalized anxiety, separation anxiety, and oftentimes symptoms of anxiety travel together. The first line of treatment for my patients after they've done their wellness strategies that we've just discussed is cognitive behavioral therapy. What's so amazing about integrating meditation for daily stress in your life is that then you are already more self-aware. In order to utilize the tools of psychological healing, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, you need to have self-awareness so you can label your thoughts, your feelings, and come up with a healing plan with your doctor or therapist. And of course, we always like to do the least amount of medications or no medications, but there are times when someone's having extreme anxiety and stress where you and your doctor can come up with a plan that works best for you.
we are in an emergency situation. Because when we feel the stress in a big company, for example, and when we have a PTSD, anxiety, so, and in our world, we are in an emergency situation every day. We need to feel better immediately without effort. So we can't say to the person, you must meditate like this, you must be like that, 30 minutes, etc. It's not, it's beautiful huh, to meditate like that, but it's not uh, adapted to our world. Time. When someone comes, what we do? We give a practice to the person. We don't talk, just we practice immediately. The person arrives to me and I say, okay, just we clap the hand and we close our eyes and just we are sitting down like a mountain. Just we can visualize a mountain and we can breathe mentally the stability of the mountain. We visualize a mountain, we breathe in the stability, we keep stability and we exhale the stability of the mountain in all our body. We meditate like a mountain. We train our mind. We enter in another state of consciousness and we unplug the brain from running all time, all time. So when we do that, the most important is the transfusion of energy. We must be very calm. We must be in peace. Emergency well-being means we feel better immediately. When I live in my monastery in the Himalayas, when I have worked with my Rinpoche in Buddhism, I remember just to see him, to feel his presence, it makes me more calm immediately. It's a question of energy, so we don't talk about the suffering. We don't ask, why are you stressed? Just we say to the person, we can meditate like a mountain. We can be sitting down like a mountain, or we can detox the negativities and meditate like a wave. And we use a visualization because a visualization in the brain creates a cognitive process. The cognitive process immediately sends a neurochemical message to all the body. And just the person feels better immediately, without effort, without talk, without concept, without blah, blah. <laughs> it's efficient. Immediately, we unplug. We are more present to our life. We feel better. So in our world, yes, emergency well-being, it's so important because everyone we need to feel better immediately, without effort, without concentration, with no blah blah. Peace in my heart, in my
my life forever. Peace. Oh